All right. Well, welcome everyone. This is uh, the second in a series of webinars for community energy ambassadors or anyone else who's interested in learning about clean energy. Uh, I'm Melissa Birch. I'm with the Clean Energy Resource Teams and based at the University of Minnesota Extension. Uh, and um, I am joined by Heidi and Imani, who will be talking a little bit about uh, saving money and energy in your home as well as a little bit more about the clean energy resource teams. I do want to uh, say a little bit about the Community Energy Ambassadors. Uh, this is a program that we have that focuses on giving folks in communities the resources that they need to help other folks in their communities um, engage in the clean energy transition. So energy efficiency, renewable energy, electric vehicles, all of these things are, there are a lot of opportunities of, around right now. And so we really want to give folks the tools to take advantage of those opportunities. So I am going to pass it along, I believe, to Heidi, and uh, she's going to get started. Thanks, Melissa. Um, as Melissa said, as you're doing outreach, this is going to be a research resource for you to use. And we are also always a resource for you to use too, if you have questions on anything clean energy related. Um, so the purpose of this presentation is to help you learn more about home energy efficiency and also give you some ideas about how to present this information to others. So we're going to talk a little bit about certs and home energy use in general and then making your home more comfortable and efficient and also paying for those projects. So Clean Energy Resource Teams or CERTS is a statewide partnership with a shared mission to connect individuals and their communities to the resources they need to identify and implement community-based clean energy projects. We support communities and their members with energy conservation energy efficiency, and renewable energy technologies and practices for their homes, businesses, and local institutions. What we like to do to make things more interactive, especially in person, but also on this webinar, is to do a little bit of trivia with people to keep them engaged. Um, so we're going to see what you know about different home energy efficiency topics. So putting something... Um, I want you to put in the chat what you think uses the most energy in your home. So whether you think it's like heating and cooling or appliances or, you know, your son's Xbox, you know, anything. What do you think uses the most energy in your home? You can put that in the chat. I don't think we should count Pete's answer. <laughs> You might know a little too much. <laughs> That's smart for a lot of different categories. <laughs> Looks like everybody, for the most part, knows the answer. So the HVAC definitely uses the most energy, followed by water heaters, appliances, lighting, and electronic or TV devices. Next question. How much electricity does the average Minnesota home use in one month? Do you think it's 80 kilowatt hours, 800 kilowatt hours, or 8,000 kilowatt hours? And then you can just put the letter in the chat. Also, it looks like we have a lot of smart people, um, about 800 kilowatt hours. Um, you might not have the habit of looking at your, your electric bill every month. I know mine is comes through my email, so I don't get it in the mail anymore. Um, so I don't always look, but we'll kind of talk about how you can find that information and see where you are and where you fall compared to the average use. So some simple steps to home energy efficiency would be first, ask questions like, what is my home energy use? When is it highest? What kind of improvements can I make to increase the home energy efficiency? Determine which no-cost improvements to implement, and then determine which low-cost improvements you can implement and then plan for the future. So like we said, understanding your home energy use is the first step. Um, a typical household uses about 800 kilowatt hours per month, and that's the 
kind of the graphic on where those fall, where your different uses fall. Um, natural gas consumption is often more compared to that. Um, so one more question. What season do you think your energy bills are the highest in your home? Knowing that we all live in Minnesota, I think those answers make a lot of sense. Um, depending on your home, it can be different on different seasons. Um, it could be dependent on the specifics of your household, how you're using electric or gas. Um, a lot of winter, it's coming from, if you have a natural gas, it could come from the furnace fan, in-floor electric, baseboard and mini splits. Summer electric could be AC cooling, or a lot of times if you have children, they're more ho they're home more often in the summer, so they might be using more electricity. Um, one good resource we have is uh, Melissa Birch's utility bill from quite a few years ago. But um, this is super helpful to look at because you can see what happened throughout the year and when exactly the bill was the highest and what happened during those times. So you can do this with your own bill too and see throughout the year what was going on. So super helpful with that. If you have an online account, you can also look at um, your usage throughout the week um, and then throughout the year too. So that's really helpful information. So things you can do to make your home more comfortable and efficient. We have first, like we said, HVAC is the number one electric use in your home. So a thermostat, you can have different kinds of thermostats, make, or even if you don't, if you have a manual thermostat, you can keep your heat at 68 degrees in the winter during the day and lower at night or when you're away. Um, open your curtains during the day to let the sun warm your home and close at night to keep the heat in. Use insulated curtains. And in the summer, you can do the opposite. Close your curtains during the day to keep the heat out um, if you have certain facing windows. Different kinds of thermostats, um, manual thermostat is just like it says, you have to change it. It doesn't change itself and energy can be wasted because it is the same temperature all the time. Or if you have someone in your house who likes it really hot and then it stays that way. So programmable are um, really nice that you can program them for different times of day when you're gone, when it's night, uh, when you leave for extended time. Smart ones are, um, also very nice, they're a little more expensive, but they're Wi-Fi enabled and you can monitor them from outside of your home. And they also can learn preferences of what people like in the home. So remember also to close all windows and doors when running the furnace or air conditioner. And to keep out cold winter drafts, you can use draft snakes, sweeps, and weather stripping for doors, uh, closing the latch windows, including storm windows. If you have an older home, putting storm windows on your house, that helps too. Adding plastic film to the windows can help a lot, as well as, like we mentioned before, insulated curtains. Those can help a lot too, especially in an older drafty home. If you have a forced air system, make sure to change your furnace filter monthly. If you have a programmable or smart thermostat, they can remind you when to change your furnace filter, which is a nice feature for sure. And it'll help your furnace to keep running more efficiently independently. Since water heating also takes a lot of electricity, different things you can do to reduce your water heating costs would be to install a water sense faucet aerators and water efficient shower heads. If you've ever visited us, visited us at a CERTS event, we may have given you a shower head. <laughs> Um, we have had many of those to give away and they're nice and useful. Set your water heater temperature at 120 degrees to save energy and reduce the chance of burns and use cold water for washing clothes. All of the high, high efficiency washing machines do great with cold water. They're meant to use cold water with, so kind of a nice way to save energy there and take shorter showers. So there are some other cost items you can do to upgrade your house. So quick question, which label helps you identify energy efficient products? Do you think it's energy saver, EPA approved or energy star label?
correct. Energy star is the right answer. I think it's been around for quite a while, so good you know it. If appliances need replacement, look for Energy Star appliances that qualify for utility rebates. Most utilities will offer re rebates on different appliances. Refrigeration is one of the main ones. Um, if you have an older refrigerator, it can use up to 1,700 kilowatt hours a year. New ones are only 450 kilowatt hours a year. So pretty good change. Air sealing and insulation. Make sure you know that infiltration is not the same as ventilation. So infiltration occurs through gaps or cracks in the building, as well as around poorly sealed windows and doors. And we all want our houses to be ventilated, but it's not the same as losing all of your air heating or cooling outside of your house. So infiltration is unintentional and unwanted and increases energy costs. Adding or replacing insulation can save a lot of energy by reducing peak loads and make your home way more comfortable and save you money. So windows and doors often need to be repaired to make them more energy efficient. Um, and you can save on the cost of installing new ones if you repair them. So you can repair different damage components. Maybe you have an older home and you have locking windows. Just replacing the lock can sometimes help that a lot. Um, defective air sealing, loose or missing hardware, and proper exterior flashing, worn or damaged weather stripping. So just replacing the weather stripping around your windows and doors can definitely help a lot too. If you do need to buy new windows, you can look at the U factor and the lower the better on that. Uh, make sure they have Energy Star labels and make sure they have multiple glazing. So if it's double or triple paned, um, they can be filled with gas, low E coatings and insulating spacer. Another big energy saver is a heat pump. And we will have a heat pump webinar next week. So if you wanna learn more information about all of what they do. As ambassadors, you're not expected to be experts in heat pump technology. I will tell you a secret that not all of us at CERTs are experts at heat pump technology, but we do know the basics that they operate as an air conditioner in reverse when they're heating. Um, and basically it's the same technology that a refrigerator uses. So it's not new technology, it's just been adapted for new uses. So it's not necessarily something that people should be scared of because it's something that's been around a while actually. And it moves heat instead of making heat. Here are pictures of a couple different uh, heat pumps. The one on the right is a mini split. And a lot of people use those if they wanna regulate the heating and cooling in different rooms in their house at different temperatures. Um, and then on the left is more of a whole home. So I'm going to pass it off to Imani, and she is going to talk about paying for your home energy projects. Thanks, Heidi. Hi, everyone. I'm Imani, West Central Regional Coordinator with CERTS, and I am just going to dive right into paying for these home energy projects, starting with tax credits that are available now. So these are available to anyone who has a taxable income that is equal to or more than the amount of the tax credit. Um, Previously, there were tax credit incentives for these energy efficiency upgrades, but it was capped at $500 for your lifetime. This is no more. Um, now, if you plan your projects out, you can take advantage of this tax credit each year. The overall limit is now $3,200, and that breaks down into two separate kind of categories. Um, there's a $1,200 annual limit for a combination of home envelope improvements. That's things like insulation, windows, doors, um, electrical upgrades, plus eligible water heaters, furnaces, boilers, and air conditioners. And then the remaining $2,000 can be used on any combination of heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, and biomass stoves or boilers. Next slide, please. Um, there's also a solar tax credit that's been available for a long time. It was set to slowly fade away, but the Inflation Reduction Act brought this tax credit back and set it at 30% for the next 10 years. Um, and this can also cover the cost and installation of a solar PV system. This, this tax credit also extended to include energy storage connected to and powered by solar energy. And there's also a standalone residential energy storage credit for systems less than three kilowatts in capacity. And those do not need to be connected to or powered by solar. Now I'm ready for the next one. <laughs> 
There's also some tax credits for EVs. You can get a tax credit for a fuel cell electric vehicle or a plug-in EV if you meet the income requirements and the vehicle meets the conditions listed on the slide here. The clean vehicle tax credit for qualified new EVs is $7,500 and for used EVs is $4,000. EV buyers now also have the option to transfer the tax credit to the dealer at the point of sale to directly lower the price of the vehicle by the credit amount. And you can use this tax credit twice a year, and a car that has received this tax credit can only receive it once. Okay. So now we're going to get into the residential rebate programs. Uh, you'll notice down by the QR code, it says coming soon. So um, these are not available yet, but they are coming soon. So there are two rebate programs that are available for individuals. The first that we're gonna learn about is called the Homeowner Managing Energy Savings Rebates, or HOMES for short. Um, and this program is intended to make homes more energy efficient and provide improvements like insulation, air sealing, and efficient heating and cooling equipment. Um, and this applies to existing single family homes and multi-family multi buildings as well. So how this one works is a contractor will come in and either use modeling software that determines how much energy you'll save by making certain upgrades, or a contractor will measure your energy use before and after the upgrades to determine the energy savings. Um, if you have 20% energy savings, you'll receive $2,000. For 35%, you'll receive $4,000. And if your household has low to moderate income, the rebate amount will double. So Minnesota is still currently designing its homes rebate program and approach to determine things like income verification, software to measure energy savings, and other quality assurance components. So like I mentioned before, this rebate is not available yet, but coming soon. Next is the HERE rebates, the Home Electrification and Appliance Rebate Program. And this is for homeowners and renters with low or moderate income. It will provide rebates to upgrade to more efficient electric appliances and to upgrade your home's electrical services like electric panels and to prepare for increased electricity demand. <clears throat> Excuse me. The state of Minnesota is going to roll this program out later 2024 or early 2025 as point of sale rebates, which means when you purchase the product, the rebate will reduce the amount of money you pay. Um, and this can also extend to cover installation costs, which is awesome. Um, and these go up to $14,000 available for households with an area median income less than 150%. We're going to talk about how you calculate that, um, I think, on the next slide. So some examples of upgrades that would be eligible and the maximum amount of the rebate you'll be able to get are shown on the slide. Um, these rebates can be combined and stacked with other tax credits and programs like utility rebates and really make an impact on the amount of money that you can save. Renters can also take advantage with the HERE rebates on portable items like qualifying window unit air conditioners and induction cooktops. Okay, so let's talk about AMI. Many of these rebates are available to households based on income. So the HERE rebates we just reviewed for appliances use AMI area median income to determine which households are eligible. Um, and the AMI is really just the midpoint of a region's income distribution. So Half of the households in the region earn more than the median income and half earn less. And the Department of Commerce shared a chart that calculates this for each county in Minnesota based on household size, which is what you're looking at on the slide. Um, if a household's income is 80% of the area median income, they receive the rebate for the full cost of the upgrade up to $14,000. However, if the household's income is over 150% of the area median income, the second number the second line number, they are not eligible for rebates. You can access this full PDF um, for all Minnesota counties on our website. You can use that QR code to get there. And then if you click again, it should highlight Big Stone County um, just to kind of put it in action. So, wow, it got so small presenting it. Okay, um, so 80% qualifying for the full rebate amount up to $14,000. For a household with one person would be $49,400, for two, $56,450, and so on down the chart. Um, if you earn over 150% of the AMI in Big Stone County, which for one individual would be $96,200, you would not qualify for the rebates, and so on down the chart. Okay, so timeline has been kind of 
moving, changing throughout this portion of the presentation. So rebates are coming soon, as you can see on the timeline from the Minnesota Department of Commerce Energy Office. We're getting towards the end, um, build and implement program, commerce opens programs to households late 2024 to early 2025, and then hoping that the programs will get kicked off and run until all the funds are used or 2032, whichever is first at the tail end of the timeline. All right, um, a couple more quick things. So on Minnesota, Minnesota state clean energy incentives, um, in 2023, legislature passed new bills that can be stacked with many of the federal clean energy incentives that we just talked about um, and increase the amount of money that residents can save on clean energy projects. So I just have a slide on these. Besides the home and here rebate programs, the state energy office is also offering incentives that can be combined with these programs and other tax credits available through the IRA, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the electric vehicle rebates were released in February, 2024, and those offer up to $2,500 for new EVs and $600 for used EVs on top of the federal tax credit. Um, as of today, those rebates are still available. Everything else is still a work in progress. So there is a heat pump rebate program, which will offer up to $4,000 on top of here rebates for heat pumps and a 30% tax credit for purchase and installation. The residential electric panel grants will offer up to $3,000 for residents to upgrade their panels on top of the here rebates. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the on-site energy storage systems grant will support systems connected to solar energy systems. So really good stuff coming down from the state as well. And then lastly, always remember to check your utility programs who often offer rebates and incentives to support your upgrades and help manage your costs. Um, they also can share more information about average monthly bill programs, payment plans, and additional programs for income qualified homes. So kind of adding on to what Heidi was talking about, what can you do now? Start planning. Um, since the rebates we reviewed most likely won't be retroactive, it's best to plan your project so you know what steps to take when the rebates become available. So we like to share the guide by Rewiring America. If you find, want to find out what it would take to make your home fully electric, this list from the guide shows the orders of steps you can take when you're planning your upgrades. With that, I think we're ready for questions. <laughs>